Uh, let's welcome Pastor Greg as he speaks to us, Jesus in Action. All right, it's great to be back with you today, whether you're here worshiping in the house or you're online. I always enjoy seeing friends here at ACCC and worshiping together and then um, spending time together. So uh, let's pray together as we prepare to engage with Scripture. Father, where we're broken, will you bring healing? Where we've wandered astray, would you shepherd us back home? Where we're filled with pride, would you humble us? Where we feel we have no value, will you remind us that we're created in the image of God and we have an estimable value in your sight? Would you shape us and mold us more into the character of Jesus? Because we live in a culture where there's a lot of people confused about Jesus and, and who even think that Christianity is an oppressive source of our society. So God, would you shape us to be more like Jesus so the beauty of Jesus would shine among our neighbors. We pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, because you're worthy of our worship. Amen. Amen. Well, throughout the Gospel of Mark, uh, Jesus is just always in action, all right? Uh, the Gospel of Mark is the shortest of the four Gospels, and uh, you have to, like, put on your track shoes to keep moving because Jesus is just in action, 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 with some teaching sprinkled in. And so Jesus, through his actions, is really showing us his mission and show us how the kingdom of God is invading, how the kingdom of God is uh, dethroning the powers of darkness, how the kingdom of God will ultimately have all disease will be healed and removed, how eventually within the kingdom of God, those who are marginalized will find a home, about how eventually in the kingdom of God that... Um, all who wander astray will have the invitation to come back home. It's like everything Jesus does is like a preview of the kingdom. And so we work toward that today on earth as it is in heaven. And then someday, see, we're also working, but we're also waiting. And someday when Jesus returns, it's like creation will be completely restored. And all these little signs that Jesus points to, um, you know, they're kind of like postcards, all right? They're kind of like um, an orchestra overture. When you hear it, you, you know, oh, this concert's going to be good. It's, it's like a taste. And so Jesus is giving these tastes of the kingdom to see what the kingdom of God is like and ultimately what Jesus is going to bring to us. It's worth the wait, all right? And now in Mark chapter 5, we're going to meet a few people who it's amazing how Mark brings the juxtaposition of them together because these are about as diverse people as we could ever imagine. You see, there's a man, there's a woman, and there's a child. There's a wealthy person, and there's a person who is completely impoverished. There's a prominent person in their culture, and there's someone who's marginalized, even viewed as cursed or ashamed in their society. There's an upstanding religious leader, and there's a person who is ceremonial and clean in the Hebrew law, and so can't even enter into the synagogue. He's banned from the, from the synagogue. The, this is the diversity of people that have an encounter with Jesus that's transformative for them. And so how Jesus interacts with them, I think, teaches us a lot. It also helps us to understand no matter who we are, where we've come from, what our nation, what our, what our gender, what our um, socioeconomics, whatever, our background, the gospel's for you and me. And when we look through the lens, not of culture, but of Christ, we see what everyone could become because God has poured out his life on the cross that, that could be for every person we meet. And so as we come to Mark chapter 5, well, um, let's join together in verse 22. So either in your Bible or on your device or, or look at the person next to you, whatever it takes, somehow get to Mark 5 verse 22. And so we begin, one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came to Jesus and fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying. Please come put your hands on her and she'll be healed and live. And so Jesus went with him. Jairus is a prominent person in the community. So the synagogue is like the religious and the social center of the community. And so if he's a leader of the, he's not one of the priests, but he's one of the leaders. In other words, he's like, I don't know, kind of like the president of the synagogue. You know what I mean? He, he was voted in or chosen as someone of prominence within the synagogue. Um, in the community, this would be like the chancellor of the university. This would be like the police chief. 
This would be like the superintendent of the schools. This might be like a wealthy business person or someone who's gone viral on social media and everyone knows who they are. This is a prominent person within the community. And yet he comes and he falls on his feet. At the feet of Jesus, he falls and he pleads with Jesus. See, he knows he's desperate and he turns to Jesus. Here's the risks he's taking too. Most of the people in his synagogue, remember the religious establishment, they're opposing Jesus. And he breaks through that and he's desperate and he turns to Jesus. Now, let's think about what the disciples think about this. Okay, imagine our, our, us in that place. See, we, we still haven't really figured out this whole cross thing, right? We're like, man, all this, all this power, all this authority, this is great. It's not gonna be until, in, until chapter eight that things are really going to begin to change. And then from then on, Jesus talks about the cross and about discipleship and about how he's going to be crucified and that discipleship is bearing his cross. So, so the disciples must be thinking, man, this is our big break. We're going to go to the home of a one percenter in our country. Uh, there's going to be a big crowd. We're going to get me media coverage. Hurry up. This is a chance for Jesus to make inroads and for have this big splash. And then everybody know he's the Messiah. Hurry up. Let's go, guys. Come on. And then in the midst of that, hurrying to Jairus' house, there's an interruption. And everything stops. And let's see what this interruption is. Verse 25. A woman was there who'd been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She'd suffered a lot under the care of many doctors and spent all she had, yet instead of getting any better, she grew worse. When she heard of Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and just touched his cloak because she thought, you know, if I can just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt within her body that she was healed. This is a woman who has been bleeding for 12 years. I, I just wanna mention one kind of semantics thing, so, um, or um, structural thing, literally. So the way that Mark writes this, these, what, four, four or five verses, they're all one long sentence. There's only one verb, and that's the woman reaching out. All the rest, there's seven participles. Now, that may sound pretty boring, right? Okay, and you're like, is this like junior year of English in high school? But here's why this is uh, really instructive for us. See, in a lot of languages, including the Greek language, if you have one verb, one action, and then there's all these participles piled up, it's like piling it up. It's like us having seven adjectives or something like that. And so the readers oh, would say, well, you know, Mark, author, you're really piling this up. You're really letting us know how miserable this woman is, how horrific her suffering is. She's been subject to bleeding for 12 years. It's probably menstrual bleeding. Think about it. The physical exhaustion, the depths of her anemia, the financial poverty that she's fallen into. Who knows in antiquity what these doctors had been trying to do, these doctors to cure her? Who knows if there were scams along the way? She's lonely and isolated because she's unclean in the Hebrew law. Probably no one has touched her for 12 years. Imagine no touch for 12 years. Some of us had a hard time with that for a few months in the pandemic, right? Imagine 12 years. Imagine everything she missed, family and friends, neighbors. And she would have been viewed by some in the culture as cursed. God must have cursed you with that worldview. And she must have been asking the same spiritual questions you and I ask. God, why me? Why am I suffering? How long? Where are you? Are you snoozing, God? Come on. She must have been asking some of the same painful spiritual questions. And I just want to remind us, we see this woman every day. Because in our context, this is like a person who's sick, but they don't have any medical insurance and the, and the debt spirals. Matter of fact, I want to say this. At one time years ago, when our children were young, because of some health issues, we had $57,000 of medical debt. Now, I'm grateful because God provided beautifully through some, our church, a foundation, uh, worked extra, and trimmed some things, and I'm grateful, but but it's pretty scary to have outrageous medical debt, right? Um, this is like someone whose home has been foreclosed and they're spiraling into homelessness. This is someone who's isolated and lonely. This is someone who's spiraling in financial debt. 
This might be a woman at the border who says, I just want a better life for my family. This is like someone who works long hours, but then they have to decide, now let's see, this month should we buy food or clothes or medicine or turn on the heat or put diapers on our kids, okay? And here's my question, and I've wrestled with this, studying this text and, 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 and journeying with it. Do I see her? Do I even notice her? Am I like the apostles? Man, that's, we're, we're on the way to Jairus' house, man. Let's go to Jairus' place, right? Because that's where the action is. That's, matter of fact, there's even ministry action there. And do I notice the people who maybe in our society are invisible? And yet God's heart breaks and longs for God's people to just care in, in whatever way we're called to care. I also want to remind us that we are this woman. We're going to come back to this. And I know we might be saying, oh, Greg, that's kind of offensive. I'm not like this desperate woman. Well, I don't know about you, but I was, I was spiritually diseased. I was spiritually hemorrhaging. I was spiritually lost. I was spiritually lonely. And Jesus didn't just pass by. But on the cross, he called me out. And he cleansed me. And he gave me a new identity, which we're going to see. So in some ways, we're really the, this woman spiritually, and we see this woman all around us. But let's see how Jesus viewed her and engaged with her. Verse 30, at once Jesus realized power had gone out from him, and he turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see people crowding against you, his disciples answered, yet you ask, who touched me? So here's the crowd. Now imagine oh, it's hundreds, maybe thousands, but everyone's crowded around. We know, man, this is going to be a great scene because here's Jairus, prominent community. Jesus, what's going to happen here? Is he going to be able to heal this guy's daughter? Is he going to get there in time? We're all crowded around. And remember, this is in a time where we where didn't have Netflix, okay? You know, you, there wasn't a lot going on. This, this is the big show, man. Everybody in town is here. This is thousands or hundreds of, of, of people, we're all packed around, we're hurrying, and all of a sudden, everybody starts bumping into each other, and there's murmurings like, what happened? I don't know, wait a minute, we're on our way to Jairus. Why are we stopping? Jesus stopped? Why? Who, who is it? it? It must be a VIP. There must be something really important. Who? Wait a minute. It's that woman? That, anybody know her name? No? Okay. I, it's that sick woman who we see? Why is Jesus stopping? What's this about? Now, here's what's amazing. Why does Jesus stop? Well, he doesn't stop to heal her because she's already healed. And he takes the risk because if Jesus keeps on going, people won't know that someone touched him, which could make him ceremonially unclean, right? And he's making Jairus wait. Jairus might be thinking, hey, wait a minute, Jesus, this is malpractice, okay? You have someone who can be healed anytime, but my daughter's dying, right? I mean, Jairus might be upset, but he still stops. And again, here we have Jesus in action. And here's what I think Jesus' actions communicate to us. Each person matters to God. And Jesus is going to heal her body, but that's not enough. He's also going to pour his grace into her soul give her a new identity, and restore her back to her community. That's kind of the holistic mission of Jesus. And so again, I have to ask, am I, uh, I'll personally, is Greg Mosell too busy chasing after the gyruses to notice this woman or this man or, or this person? Am I too acculturated in our world? Uh, is my lens so, so much that I don't notice people who are on the margins or invisible in our culture. By the way, some people might be like this woman, and they're dressed nice, and they have a good education, but they're still desperate and broken inside. Well, and so now Jesus calls this woman out, okay? He doesn't just pass by. He calls her out. Verse 33, the woman, knowing what happened to her, fell at his feet and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. Jesus said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Be free from your suffering. Jesus draws this one woman out of the crowd. And here's why I think so. Because she is seeking and she knows she's desperate. I think that's what most often stops Jesus. 
You know, a lot of the religious establishment who are like, I'm doing fine. Oh, maybe Jesus, if you might help my life a little bit or help me to be a little bit more, more successful. I think Jesus there gives a parable and says, if that intrigues you, come and ask. Let's talk about it. And is ready to pass by. But he knows those who are seeking, who are searching, and know, I'm desperate. I'm desperate for God. I'm desperate for, for redemption. I'm desperate for a new center to my life. I'm desperate for a purpose beyond just, just uh, living, making a lot of money, and someday dying, and they put you know, dirt on, on my face in the ground, right? I, I, I'm desperate for God, whether I've known it or not. And here's what's fascinating. Jesus says to her daughter, that must have really snapped, captured her attention, right? Daughter. See, he, he, here's what's amazing. Um, by the way, this is the only place where Jesus calls someone daughter in the Gospels. And here's what's amazing. See, in the culture, this is a woman with no name. But to Jesus, this is a daughter of God. Isn't that beautiful? And it really challenges us because Jesus is now publicly reminding her of her identity. She has a new identity. It's no longer that invisible, suffering woman. And even though we still may suffer, we're not invisible to God. And what Jesus is really saying is, here's your new identity. I'm going to make sure everyone hears this. You're a daughter of God. Where do we find our identity? Okay. If we try to find our identity in our culture, and, and by the way, we're all going to wrestle with this the rest of our lives. Okay. So I'm just reminding us to have this as kind of our mantra, our lens. As soon as we have as our identity, our, our career or our, our, our profession, it's going to own us. We'll probably become workaholic and we'll do a lot of damage and then we'll achieve a whole bunch. And then we'll say, oh, that was, oh, but, but there's still people achieving more. So we'll have to achieve more. And then we realize, oh, there's even more people achieving and we'll never feel like we've really arrived. Or, oh, that person, if I could just have that person, I know I'd be loved, and that person would make me look good, and then we'll do whatever it takes to keep that person, no matter whether it's honoring to Jesus or not. And then something happens with that person. They dump us, they break up with us, they, they move or they die, and we realize, wow, my whole identity. Or we become so desperate that we turn to substances to numb us, or we cut in order to feel something, right? Or, you know, you know whatever it is, we all turn to different things. Now, those can be beautiful gifts of God, some of those, right? To, to have a good career, good education, to, to have someone we love, care about. Those are beautiful gifts of God, but as soon as those become our identity, they own us. And we have to keep feeding the idol, and it'll shape us and warp us. Or we can say, you know, my greatest identity, I'm, I'm going to just keep reminding them, I'm going to grow in this the rest of my life. My greatest identity is in Christ. And that means rather, rather I get a promotion or I get a pink slip. Right, I get a pink slip, and they say, uh, uh, security will meet you at the door, and in a box will be everything <laughs> from your desk, and your email has been um, disabled, right? Rather we're in a great relationship, or rather there's a breakup. Rather we feel like we're popular with the crowd we most want, or, or we feel alone. Rather we feel like valuable, or rather we feel... Pfft, our identity in Christ remains the same. Jesus says, you're my daughter, you're my son, I love you, I treasure you. And if we're in Christ, our sins have been nailed to the cross, we're forgiven and we're called to be God's hands and feet and voice. We have purpose in a broken, wounded world. And that the world can never take away from us. There's no downturn that's going to take that away from us, right? So here's what's amazing. See, in verse 29, Jesus gives her power. But in verse 34, Jesus gives her peace. See, for Jesus, it, it isn't enough for her to just pass by. He wants this encounter with her. And then Jesus shares this strange statement. He says, you know, uh, I know that power went out of me. I, 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 true life confession, I, for, for a long time, I didn't really understand. How can power go out of Jesus? Does that mean he have limited power? Is it Jesus just saying that? What, is, what does it mean? And I think through this message and, and just, isn't it amazing how we can study scripture and we think we know it. And then we read something, we hear something, and it's like, it's like the ocean depths. It, it, it's inexhaustible. 
what God has for us in Scripture and, and in different seasons of our lives. See, I think power did go out of Jesus, and I think he felt it. And here's why. Remember, everything Mark is a preview of Jesus' mission. And there would come a time where Jesus would pour out all of his power. He would, all of his power, all of his authority, all of his privilege. He would humble himself and he'd be nailed to the cross. And, 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 and all, of, all of that power, all of that humanity in some ways would, would just be poured out of him. And, and the disease and illness, the virus of sin would, would come upon him. Imagine that, how weakened he must have been on the cross, taking all the filth and the sin and the guilt upon himself on the cross. See, this is like a preview of what he's going to be doing. And it's just, it's probably that first, in some way, the first time Jesus feels that, and it's like, wow, that's what's coming. And Jesus did all of that for you and me, because we're like this woman who've come home, and Jesus says, well, don't just pass by. I have more for you because I want to give you a new identity. I want to give a peace. I want to call you to be part of my purposes. And it's going to come at a great cost. So in verse 35 now, um, this is an inclusio. Like, so there's an opening story, and then there's a story woven within it, and then we come back to the other story. And this is woven together. This is a literary masterpiece. It's woven together to compare and contrast and learn from them. So now all of a sudden, it's like, oh, that's right. We got so caught up in this. We were on our way to Jairus' house. What happened with that? Well, in verse 35, while Jesus was still speaking, people came from Jairus' house. Your daughter is dead. Why bother the teacher anymore? And Jesus said, well, don't be afraid. Believe. Here's the mysterious timing of Jesus. I got to be honest, I, a lot of times I don't understand Jesus' timing. Okay, because I think I know the timing that God ought to be on, right? And oftentimes it's not my timing, right? You see, Jairus must have been asking, Jesus, why did you wait? Why did you take this detour? Don't you care about my daughter? And Jesus says, trust me. Because when we really trust Jesus, even when there's mystery, and there may be some people who've experienced some really painful things. Okay? And, and, and when there's mystery like that, and Jesus says trust, oftentimes we end up with more than we ever could have imagined, more than we ever could have even asked for. I got to share, in my life, it's been mainly through disappointments and, and challenges and even some tragedies that God has shaped me, taught me, Help me to treasure Jesus the most. I sometimes pray, I think I've shared this, I sometimes pray, Jesus, help me to read this in somebody's book or to hear it in somebody's sermon instead of having to go through it myself. And, and a lot of times God, God is gracious with that. And sometimes I think it's like, Greg, this is a fallen, damaged, wounded world. Stuff's going to happen, but I'm going to redeem it. And God's timing is so often, or like Jairus, God, why are you waiting? Don't you care? This is like malpractice, okay? And, and sometimes we get more than we ask. Here's an example. Uh, 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 this woman, I, I think in some ways she's really just kind of superstitious. It says she heard about Jesus. I, I don't think she has it all put together. She just knows, man, if I could, this is some kind of like, like, like God, man, prophet, or whatever. I, I just know this. I've heard he heals, and I'm desperate, and I'm going to reach. If I can just touch him, I'll, I'll be healed. That's all she knows. But she has this trust. There's something about Jesus. And there's this act of trust. You see, what she wants to do is just touch and go. Just, if, if I say, I can go. And Jesus says, whoa, whoa, I have so much more for you than just touch and go. And, um, and so she just wants touch and go to stop bleeding. But instead, Jesus restores her. He restores her body with healing. He restores her identity as a daughter, and he restores her back to community when the whole community knows, wait a minute, this is a daughter of God. She's been cleansed. Look at this. I publicly see this. Wow. So she got more than she could have ever imagined, even though for 12 years she must have been saying, God, I don't get this. Where are you? You know, Jairus' daughter, Jairus, I want my daughter healed. Well, he got that 
and a whole lot more. Because, see, he didn't just get his daughter healed, although praise God that Jesus raised her. But, but you see, when he raised her from the dead, it means Jairus got to see a front row seat of like, you got to be the Messiah. You just raised her from death. I saw it. You raised her from death. And I'm, the kingdom of God, the gospel, must have begun to become real. And then on the other side, when Jesus is raised, and I'm sure most of his friends, especially religious establishment, no way, no way. He's like, no, no, everybody, let me bear witness to this. I've seen him raised. He's risen. See, he got more than he could have asked for. Even though it meant in the short term there were some real challenges and mystery. And so I'm learning to begin to come to peace with God's timing. I still wrestle with it. But I'm beginning to see, I, you know, again, honestly, and, and then we're going to wrap it up. I used to, for years, going through difficult times, I just say, okay, God, I'm going to be faithful, and I'll open my eyes afterwards. And I'm starting to open my eyes and lean in in the middle of it and say, all right, God, I don't, I, I'm just going on, on record. I don't like this. Okay, God, but you're doing something. I don't know. I may never figure it out, but I'm going to lean in because I have a feeling you're in this somehow and something's going to happen. You're going to shape me. You're going to use this. Something's gonna, I don't know what it is, but would you use this for your glory? And would you lament and walk alongside me and hold my hand through this because I need you and I need your people through this. So, <clears throat> matter of fact, let me give an example of this and then we're going to wrap it up. But I think I shared this several years ago, but I, I'm going to share this everywhere to anybody who will listen partially because it's about my daughter, and I know you want to hear about my daughter. And the other part of it is, I preach this to myself in time. So our daughter, who's now 29, I know you want to hear about her. She works at Children's Hospital Philadelphia, teaches at Eastern University. She's fantastic. But 28 years ago, she was one year old. Maybe a year and a half, two years. And it was her well care appointment, okay? She did one, one and a half, two. And, and so we take her, and, and the pediatrician's interacting with her, and, and, and she's happy, she's getting a, attention, and all of a sudden, just kind of quietly, because, you know, you don't show the one-year-old, okay, you see this needle? We're going to stick this in you. They don't, they just quietly, and, and Anne's like, and she just begins to cry. She's just crying. And then she looks at me. I'll never forget this look. By the way, I have her permission to share this. She looks at me, and her look was like this you knew, you knew they were going to do this, and you brought me here. It's like, you owe me an explanation, okay? I mean, you just see in her eyes. And then what did she do? D uh, did she say, I'm getting an attorney, I'm going to sue for emancipation? No, she didn't do that. What did she do? She fell into my arms and just cried because she knew, I, I don't get this. Dad knew, but you know, and somewhere within her was this thinking. I mean, she she couldn't develop it, but emotively was. But what I know about dad, I trust for what I don't know. I think often with God, we're like that. It's like, God, this hurts. And I don't understand it, but somehow I'm still going to fall into your arms and I'm going to trust that you're still holding me. You still care about me, even though this hurts. Somehow there's something going on that I can't see. And that's what happens with both of these people. And we get a front row seat to watch it. So... Wrapping it up in verse 41, now, now we come back to Jairus, okay? And, and, and so um, uh, Jesus goes to Jairus' house. By the way, for Jairus, there, there's a lot of trust here because he doesn't say, forget it, Jesus, she's dead. What are you talking about? I'm out of here. He says, all right, we'll, we'll go to my house. Doesn't make sense, but I've seen you do powerful stuff. I don't know. So he still goes with him to the house. Because a lot of us would have locked the door and said, get out of here, right? But this is what happens. And then Jesus, in verse 41, took her by the hand and said, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. And they were completely astonished. The word get up, in, or originally, because remember the New Testament originally written, written in the Greek language. And um, the word get up, is translated from, from the Greek word, compound word, antisteme, and it's, a, it's, it's one of the words for resurrection. Jesus is literally saying, I'm resurrecting you from the dead. Wow. 
And so this is just another pointer to the kingdom of God, that there is coming, that, that there will be victory over death, that someday we'll die, but Jesus will say, little boy, little girl, you, you who I love, get up. It's time for eternity. I'm not going to leave you in the grave. Isn't that powerful? And you're going to enter into, we're going to enter into a restored, perfect creation. But here's what's amazing. He takes the little girl by the hand. What a sweet scene. You know, he comes into the home and he, and he takes her by the hand. But let's remember this. There would be a time when Jesus' father would not take him by the hand. And on the cross, he let his own son go. And on the cross, Jesus took all of our sin and our filth and our guilt and our brokenness and our depravity, and he took it upon himself all alone on the cross so that you and I could be restored to our Father. See, we're this little girl too. We've been raised, and we're being restored. We've been restored, and we will face-to-face -face someday. You know what's awesome? In eternity, we, we won't need faith because faith will be replaced by sight. We'll see. Isn't that, isn't that awesome? And so, and so Jesus went to the cross and, and his father said, I'm, I'm allowing this so that our sin and filth can, can, can be redeemed, it can be extinguished, and so that Jesus could be raised. And now through the Spirit, he's holding our hand through the seasons of life. So let's put it all together to wrap it up. Jairus... He's the religious leader of the synagogue. The woman, she was banished from the synagogue. Jairus is a man in a male-dominated culture. This woman's a female, marginalized in her society. Jairus was prominent among his neighbors. This woman was invisible uh, to her neighbors. Her, her name's not even listed. Jairus was a wealthy guy. Uh, this woman was in the spiral of poverty. Jairus would have been viewed as blessed by his neighbors. This woman would have been viewed as cursed. But both of them, the reason Jesus transforms, the, the reason Jesus has impact in both of their lives, because both of them were desperate, and they knew it, and they came to Jesus with that desperation. They put their faith, their trust in Jesus. Remember this, when Jesus says your faith ha has healed you, it wasn't just faith that, uh, that healed her. It was faith in Jesus that heals her. See, I think a mustard seed of faith in Jesus is a far greater value than just some kind of, you know, sometimes you hear people, oh, just have faith. It's like, no, no, what will faith do for you? It's faith. It's the object of our faith. It's faith in God, in Christ that makes all the difference. So wrapping it up, maybe we're people of privilege like Jairus. To be honest, most of us here are people of, of, of some kind of privilege, some kind of promise, some kind of resources, like Jairus. Don't be ashamed of that. Instead, recognize it and let's steward it in a way that blesses our world. And we need to humble ourselves. Say, Jesus, I'm desperate. I need you. Maybe we're more, we feel more, more marginalized, like this woman, which probably many of us in different contexts feel that way. And we're marginalized. Remember this, we're daughters and sons of the king. That's Jesus' mission, is to rescue us, to bring us home to himself, to through the Spirit be holding our hand through this life. And he's preparing the restored creation for us. So we work toward people getting a chance to sniff out a little bit of the kingdom of God on earth. As we wait, it's worth the wait. Father, we're grateful that we have th these episodes out of so many things that Jesus did. You guided Mark to capture the experience of these three people. So different, so diverse people. And there's a message in that, that you've come for all peoples, even me, even each of us. So God, may we reach out to you and trust you. Give us faith. Sovereignly give us faith to trust you with the next step and then the next step, and the next step of our lives. Praise, glory, and honor be to you, God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.